tape, load it into the system, show you everything. We're going to do online and uh, offline as well, but I've been trying to get a 2.0 release tape with the diagnostic release that's coming up with diagnostic information blocks and the M2 monitor and all that kind of stuff. They haven't canceled it. Well, they put it on hold, it's, it's on hold. Gary Hill's drawing, redrawing it in there. The installation procedure is still going to be the same, no matter what. The problem they're fighting over with is the monitor. At least that's what some people are fighting over. The other people, the ones that need these diagnostics, are fighting over improvements of the diagnostics catching things. So we've got two, two battles going on here. One's over what it should look like when I'm running it. Do I want to look at address 20 for expected, or do I want expected to show there? That's a pretty dumb fight in my book. Myself, I prefer looking at numbers. I prefer having the address there. I may not remember the address in uh, SRX where I look for my special buffers and stuff, but I got diagnostic listings to look that stuff up. But if I see text and then that doesn't work or something, I can get into a lot of trouble not knowing where I'm looking. I don't mind having text there. The other battle is there should be two types of diagnostic releases or packs. One should be a reliability pack, high level diagnostics that really work the machine hard. And the other one should be a emergency pack. PM and EM should be two different packs. One with short loops like Chipwell Falls release, the MTA monitors and very, very small pieces of code. Troubleshooting a problem with MTS monitor can be hectic since it uses conditional jumps to determine where to put its output. And then it's, for example, JCB, the jump condition basic with MTS monitor. Checking conditional branches, and then uses those jumps to figure out where its output's supposed to go. I can hit one of about 60 modules. All your uh, ARs, or GRs, SRs, the scalar register modules, where they fan in, at least on a Cray 1S, where they fan everything in. Every one of those GRs feeds into your conditional branches of your F registers. Pick a bit on any one of those through the HS module, and you won't find it. You won't find that guy. That's a tough one to find. And diagnostics won't even help you, because the diagnostic that checks the, con the jumps, the conditional jumps, uses them to figure out where to put its output. In a case like that, I would prefer having a pack that has the original MTA monitor on it, which is only 100 instructions long or 200, I forget. Yeah, there's all kinds of monitors, but I don't mind having MTS. It has breakpoint features in it, and there are nice things in it. But running it in MTA monitor, I would not want to replace the original MTA. Well, it will be available on that pack anyway. Everything's always available. We, everything's always available. It's a matter of what they'll officially let you use. I mean, the stuff's already written. You know what I mean? No, but you can get it. I mean, you just have to uh, write it possibly in or it in yourself or something. But the, the fight is over Chippewa versus Mendota, high reliability versus low reliability. Uh, Mendota puts together a program and it really works the machine and scrubs it, and then Chippewa says, well, it's no good if my jump instructions don't work. So th there are two types of machines you're troubleshooting. One is broken and one is working. With the working machine, you want to make sure it's still working. With the broken machine, you want to find out what portion of it's broken. Now look at that, it's two separate viewpoints. SRX or CMD, CMX. within seven, eight years. The only thing they've been fighting about is the monitor that runs between zero and a thousand. But anyway.
the 2-0 release is, is it's a common point between the two diagnostic departments. Isn't there one guy that's in charge of Well, there is no longer a diagnostic department here, really. Uh, they're basically diagnostic test and integration. It's supposed to take what's done in Chippewa and check it out here, distribute it to the field, and resolve problems on it. Who's right in the high level then? They're all being moved to Chippewa Falls. In fact, the diagnostics group that used to write onlines and stuff here has basically moved to other departments because they don't want to go to Chippewa. Kevin Blommel, Corinne Beckstrom, uh, Glenn Peterson, they're on Cray 2 projects or in the IOP group or something because of the, the battle. They also didn't exactly, I really shouldn't say this on tape, but prefer working with Dennis Goggins and the pressure that they had in this department here. But Dennis Goggins, now where is he? Is he over in the he, He's here. Okay. And he was previously responsible when Jim Smith was the previous guy in charge. And his priorities were in the Cray 2 diagnostics. And things, he didn't exactly like the pressure either in the fight between Gene Geisler and the diagnostics group here. It's basically what it comes down to. Well, where is Goggins going to go now? Uh, he's still here, but I think it's basically diagnostic test and integration. Oh. And he's got two or three people, they're up on the hill. But I'm not sure what their functions are going to be in the future. And they're basically moving all that to Chippewa to try to avoid some of this problem. They don't have the machines here either, you know. But that's two different types of machines that have to be approached with software in two different ways. Oh, yeah, it's a lot different whether you have a machine that runs and intermittently fails or whether you have a machine that doesn't do anything. Does intermittently runs. Time out. <laughs> Time out. Time out. Right, Hank? Time out. <laughs> There's uh, that's quite a difference in the velocity. Yeah. But uh, I would never run MTS in an MTA mode because working in bug classes, I used to throw these switches and I used to be able to see how easily MTA would catch them. And then when I saw the same, same problem exactly, throw the same switch with an MTS, same diagnostic but MTS monitor, forget it. You're, you're off in the woods. You're trashed out, really. A lot more code in there, that's all. When you start trying to find simple problems with complicated tests, it's much like trying to perform your own brain surgery. Yep. <laughs> but anyways, we're going to talk about diagnostics a little bit more next week. All I want to do is finish this whole program flow picture and let you work on the exercises, explain the exercises too. Page 511 just shows the basic picture of where our software comes from. Anything that executes on the Cray is going to be a dollar ABD type data set. Even diagnostics and stuff. By the way, another good problem to watch out for are cross-compile problems. If you're generating binaries on a four-processor machine that has extended memory addressing, but the machine you're testing it on is a Cray 1S, Software is supposed to be able to cross-compile, and it, it has successfully. But with the 114 COS release, for example, the COS generated and assembled fine. But when we got the CSP that runs in the job, that used some Pascal and Fortran stuff, and that did not cross-compile. We spent a month troubleshooting an operating system problem that was a cross-compile problem. It did not compile on an X4 for an X2. And it's supposed to, but with 114 they had some bugs in there. But Cal itself will compile for the type of machine you have, provided you tell them that you've got extended memory addressing on the Cal statements and that sort of thing. They also put out the output listings with the cross-reference. We can then use build and put together these dollar BLD type data sets into one program library and link them together.
And then the loader can take other BLD type data sets and anything that's in the library, pull that, put it in. The loader will also resolve all external references between modules and link the whole thing together and provide us our absolute binary. Update is simply another extension into this picture, except now we're putting program library structures in here. Teddy will not work on a PL-type structure, but Teddy will work on our mods. So we can create our mods, run them through Teddy, and get a new program library, and then run that program library back through Update and pull out specific programs we want from it. So Update simply enables us to put related programs together with one data set name. We don't have to spend as much time going through the disk, doing disk I.O. to get to the disk data set catalog. And the other advantage was being able to keep track of our modifications and reactivate them and deactivate them or purge them. Yank and unyank was how we activated and deactivated. Purge and no purge is how you clean them out or uh, put them in. Any questions on this basic picture? We're just talking about putting the whole thing together. Update through Cal, through Loader, into an executable binary. Typically what's in program libraries are source programs. And going back to page 5.3 in your workbook, when we sell a Cray, we sell them the binary libraries Remember this from Monday? There's our binary libraries. These are all maintained by build. And we're, we're really not going to be concerned with build because diagnostics don't use build. That's for library structures, for coasts and iOS and stuff. Then we have our individual binaries, <coughs> binary programs. And then in here, we have our program libraries. Here's a PL, here's a PL. Anything with a PL on this release, we try to use PL after the name as a convention, but conventions can be broken. You can name it anything you want. And inside these, this is the operating system source that if the analyst needs to regenerate anything, you can go in there, make changes to it, reassemble it. The PL is the source code? The PL is the source code. The other names on this list are binaries. They're the executable program that will be in the system directory. There's another PL. Seems funny they'd mix uh, source code and binary programs are the same. Well, they don't. This is when you get a release. The first thing you install is the COS itself. Then you take a tape and mount that, and that's all your binaries. Then, if you want, you can take the tapes that have the program libraries, and typically you'll load those in third. And all these things sit on the system. I could have audited them. They used to have different IDs. That's how they used to split them apart. Was have different IDs. But when you get a release tape, coast release comes out in four or five tapes, depending upon which release you're on and stuff. They're now mixing both Cray 1S and XMP releases onto the same tape so that you're actually going to get both. It, it varies. New releases will come out in the new disk pack, the Cape Kennedy tape drives, too. But the first thing they'll install are the binaries and the binary programs, and then the PLs will come on later. And this is all the software. You take a 114 release that comes with the machine, load it into the system and do an audit. This is what you get. There are no diagnostics there yet. This is the basic supported stuff that Cray sells with the machine. So if it doesn't have a dollar sign in the PL, it's a straight executable binary. Right. If it doesn't have a PL, it doesn't have a dollar sign in it. In this list, this is a release list. I took the release tape, loaded it in, and did an audit. 
The next thing the operator analyst would do would then be restoring all his backup tapes that are his application programs and his user data and all the system stuff that's unique to his site. But this is a standard COS 114 release. And all executable binaries are in the SDR. All executable binaries that the analyst wants you to use without accessing will be in the system directory. It's up to the analyst to decide what he wants in there. For example, uh, he may not want FDOM. He may get his system directory used up very quickly. And in order to save space, he's not going to put in DS or local or some of the things that aren't related to the average user. It, it can vary. Yeah, I think everything <coughs> that's in the SDR is executable binary, but the program libraries are also in there, right? Uh, binary program libraries are in there, but binary. the update source PLs are typically not in the SDR because we don't need to access them all the time. We're just saving it on the access statement, not having to use the access statement. Typically, what's going to be in this in the system directory is everything on here except the PLs. And if it's not in the system directory, you simply have to access it. But the system directory is only so big, and it can fill up. And if it fills up, then you have to drop the system down, dead start it again with that star SDR directive in the dead start parameter file, and then run a system directory job that accesses everything you want in the system directory with an enter option on it. I got a job example here. Something like that. actually do an install and come up with this, but past classes have felt it's not necessary and a waste of time, so we're not going to do it this time around. We're going to just spend time on other things. But the jobs that I'm passing around now are the jobs you run to install the system. job that's run, I'll pass this around, is the bind, this is 112 release, but bind 112 is the name of the job that puts all the binaries there. And then you've got the program library job, and then you've got the accounting job. Ah, the system directory job is in here too, so I'll just tear these off. Then you submit the accounting job, and then you submit the system directory job. And after that, your system is usable. After those four jobs are run, you do an audit. This is what you're going to get with 114. And you're basically with an up and running system, provided there aren't any problems. But the system directory job, that's the fourth one being passed around, has the access with the inners on it. The one thing that has to be consistent between uh, releases is the data set catalog structure. And we're going through some changes in that right now because of the new permanent data set manager code. But a 110 software release should be able to access and use 114 type stuff. The product set won't work, but there should be some compatibility in the data set catalog and stuff. Your binaries may not work because of changes, but the sources and stuff should all work. And it's, it's interesting when you start combining different releases. You're running a 115, but all the products you're using are 113, and things like that. And maybe you're using a 116 coast with a 114 iOS. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but preferably you try to stay I mean, the analyst better know his stuff well enough to stay with all the same release 
it's just around here, we'll go through three different levels on the same day. Now, if there aren't any other questions, I'll explain exercise eight. So exercise eight deals with program library structures. And we're going to use the same program copy that you've used twice before. Once as a source data set from the front end, once as an executable binary on Cray mass storage. This time it's a deck, it's a regular deck in a program library called Copy PL. Uh, during break I submitted the jobs to put it on both X, X3 and X4. And the first exercise says compile it, get it out of that PL, assemble it and execute it on exercise two. Just like you did with exercise six and seven, except you're getting the source from a program library rather than from the front end or as executable binary. You're just getting it from a different place. Doing exactly the same thing. Executing copy on the data you created in exercise two. The only thing that's a copy PL though is just copy that's the only That's probably the only thing in there, yeah. You've got a program library out there called copy. Yes. And it has copy in it. Yes. It's all ready for you. All you have to do is get it out, assemble it, and execute it. Something like what we had here. Very, very similar to that, except there won't be necessarily any changes. You know. So that's just doing the exact same thing you've done, except differently. <laughs> you know, from a different place. Different. Yeah. You're doing accomplishing the same thing. It's the same program executing. You're just doing it in a different method. Exercise two says change the message in it. Remember it had a message saying this is a list of in data. Change it. Change it to say this is garbage. I don't care. That's all you're going to do is modify a line, which means you need to know the deck card number and the card name. That that you won't get until you get A. When you run A, you'll get your listing, and your listing will have your card sequence numbers on it. C says add a trailer message. So you're not modifying anything; you're inserting something. Duplicate the code that's in there. Uh, just define another message and write it into dollar out. You know, just look at the program and. The same way I write in the beginning, write it again in the end or something. Put in a trailer message. And D here says, get a list, get a deck listing of all the identifiers, all the deck names, common decks and stuff in the program libraries. And there's only going to be one out there. So, and it's on X4. So let's take these off and make this uh, X200PL. That's on X4. So you're going to have to submit it to XMP4 to get to that. And we get that just by tagging the ID on there. So you're going to have to access X200PL. In order to access it, you're going to have to do an audit. You can go interactive and audit, however you want to audit. But I'll also tell you that it's X200PL with an ID of diexis. And it is out there unless they clobbered me. It was there yesterday. <laughs> the fifth one here we're really going to do next week. But let me show you what we can do, how we can do that. The Google Calcom printer is considered a station peripheral. Therefore, to get to it, we have to stage the data set we want to it. Now this one says get a listing for uh, SR3. I don't care really what you get a listing for. SRA, SR3, that doesn't matter. It's being able to get the listing to the gold printer. Now, this is going to come out across the screens and you probably won't get to this today. I'm not worried about that. But let me just show you what it looks like. We're going to do SRA. 
we're going to access PDN equals 200, X200 PL, DN equals PL, ID equals diaxis. Update, uh, we don't have any directives in this case. All we want to do is get a listing. So we'll make that equal to zero. We don't need a new library. All we're doing is getting a listing out of the old library. So we make n equal to zero. Zeroing these things out will save time on waiting. If I had to generate a new program library, that's going to take time. And I do want the compile output, and I want it to go through cal, and I want it to go through loader. But if I want the listing, I can do a couple of things. I can dispose dollar out here. I can just dispose dollar out. Or I could just rename the listing output. Let's call it uh, S-R-A-L-S, period. Now all I can do down here, if I don't want to execute, let's say we don't care about executing this thing, all we want to do is get a listing for a diagnostic that's in a program library. Any one of those two or three program libraries over on the right. By the way, you don't want to print out GenPL. I did it once. Even on a half inch or eight and a half by 11 inch paper, it's like that thick. I have a stack of it on my desk and laser copy out. It's a very big program library. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I was talking about this GenPL. But if it's an X200PL, CrayPL, XMPPL, IOPPL, DocPL, I want you to be able to get it out with update. So we don't need to load it. All we're trying to do is get a listing for SRA out of this program library, and this will be the online one. So all I have to do now is dispose DN equals SRALS. The mainframe equals M4. And the disposition code will be to the printer. DC equals PR. Now there's a little bit more to tack on to that. Let me just get it out of the book. By the way, I will be sending out these uh, publications so that you can put them together for next week, so I'll be stacking them on your desk. So let me just check that. This is the iOS operator's guide that you'll be getting for next week. And in the back of it, it has the staging commands for the IOP station. And I'm just going to check my statement here. You can also now get the option of turning the page. I passed around some of these that have the page turned. Don't have one there. But. Here's one. And that is what I'm going to write down here. Uh, dispose G P T P R. Text equals doc. That's what it is. if you want to write that down. This is the SG51 uh, page D2. We'll be getting this next week. 
I don't really want you to do exercise E today. Probably won't have time. But we will be doing it next week when we're down on the IOP station. Is it a text statement, a separate statement? No, no, this is all part of the part of that, so let me put the up here. So that's from getting an update to the end of SRALS is all one statement? This is a statement here. That's a comma at the end, right? Yeah, this is a statement here. And then this is the third statement. Well, they are individual statements? Four different lines here. But it's one statement. Well, each I line is a statement. It's there. one job. Right. It's one job. Four, four lines in it or four statements in it. The Q is just part of this line. The text is part of this line. I just look at dollar sign CPL up there and I saw the comma on it. Yeah, right. The comma just says to here. So that, that one access is correct. Access to X200. Yeah. On X4 it will. So we'll, we'll get to exercise E next week without any problem. What we want you to be able to do is, and D can be done at any time, or go looking for that PL. But you got four exercises there to learn to work with update. So if there aren't any questions, I'll be around on the terminals answering your questions there. And you've got a half an hour until lunch, so. Auditors, really, and that's what they've been fighting about for years. Years, and I do mean years. MTA monitor, MTI monitor, MTS monitor, on lines and off lines. And they've been fighting about the interface and the monitors and not really worried about the diagnostics and improving their ability to catch failures. And a lot of the uh, scuttle between Chippewa and Mendota has been over the monitor itself, whereas SRA has not changed in 10 years. With one or two lines maybe that have been added for the XMP series or something like that. But the generation and the uh, installation process is still the same no matter what we're talking about as far as off lines or on lines, what type of monitors. The diagnostics themselves in the installation process don't matter. It's just JCL. It's not the subject of this class this week to actually uh, learn how to fix diagnostics, know how to identify it's missing this instruction at this line. But it will be our topic this week of how to, once we identify a problem and know what is missing, how to insert those changes or modifications to the diagnostic. So it won't really be the subject of this class to either interpret a failing diagnostic because offline and online diagnostics are the same. ARA, whether it's online or offline, is the same piece of code. SRA, uh, SFR, all your basic core diagnostics are essentially the same. They used to have an advanced troubleshooting dump class that would cover actually looking through paper dumps and identifying through return jump addresses where in the code he was last and what he identified was the problem and hopefully narrow you down to some loop or specific instruction that failed. Again, it's not our intent this week to cover that sort of thing. Our intent this week is simply to be familiar with the online environment and how the diagnostics fit into that. Just for my own sake, I like to put diagnostics in a couple of different categories, probably four different categories. We have the offline emergency maintenance diagnostics, EM diagnostics. This is what I would consider the Chippewa Falls release, if you wish, Chippewa Falls. Uh, scope loops, the dead, any dead diagnostic type of structure, you know, TDs, 
EXD, MTA monitors, those types of things that you need for a bare-bone broken machine, one you, that you know is broken. It doesn't work. And Kippo Falls has the best environment to develop those types of diagnostics. We then have our offlines, what I like to call preventative maintenance, the PM diagnostics. And these may come from Chippewa Falls or Mendota Heights. We've had development going on in both places for these types of things. However, the trend has been to move people out of Mendota into Chippewa Falls. The actual responsibility of Mendota is basically going to be a clearinghouse in my book. That's the way I would describe it. And these would be diagnostics like uh, the CMX, the uh, SR3, you know, the, the reliability diagnostics. They're checking for random instruction sequences and timing problems, the stuff that you're not going to catch except maybe once in a million operations. And these are the environments or the diagnostics that you should be familiar with up to this point. The scope loops and the deads would be things like EXD and the TDs, TLT. Uh, irregardless of the monitor, whether it's MTA, MTI, MTS. The next level of diagnostics would be our online. And there are two levels of onlines as well. The first level of onlines would be our batch diagnostics. These are the things that you can assemble and run as just one separate job. They run under control of the operating system. And what do they do? They add, subtract, multiply, and divide, and check their results. And these batch diagnostics are the same as you have had as the offline diagnostics. Most of them are the PM type of diagnostics. You have CMX. But batch diagnostics, these range from ARA, SRA, all the way up to CMX. There's about 20 or 30 of the common offline diagnostics that run online as batch jobs. And there's one more level of diagnostics called IOS system diagnostics. The batch diagnostics, just check out the CPU. Of course, the iOS diagnostics, check out the iOS channels. And the iOS system diagnostics will typically destroy the system. They will overwrite operating system code. They are not to be run when you've got an operating system and jobs in the system. You check out high-speed channels or buffer memory, low-speed channels. Most of these system diagnostics should not be run with an operating system and jobs in the system. These would be tests like MOS test or HSP test. They'll overwrite code that's a part of the operating system. Well, then they're considered offline, or are they considered online, too? They're considered online because they run with the operating system. The iOS system diagnostics run under the control of the iOS operating system. So they still have that piece of code, but they overwrite COS, and they will overwrite portions of iOS code. For example, buffer memory test, MOS test will destroy buffer memory and then you have to restart the system. But they are considered online. They are online. What's some of the names of these uh, iOS systems? MOS test, HSP test. Those are two specifically that should not be run with the job in the system. HSP, that's also an offline, isn't it? Well, there are HSP tests, yeah, offline, but the code is different. So that's really the, the way I see diagnostics. Uh, emergency maintenance, the broken machine type of loops, the offline reliability diagnostics that you just run and hopefully they won't catch anything. 
memory kits and things like that. And then the two level online batch diagnostics and iOS system diagnostics. We're going to learn how to install batch diagnostics. We're going to learn how to run them uh, basically the rest of the week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But tonight I want to just talk about using the Cray Online from the IOP station and some of the different commands that are available. We'll come back to installing these diagnostics and some other topics uh, Tuesday and Wednesday night. And Thursday night we're going to prepare a topic for next week, and that's APML and iOS code. The lab time, we're just going to really wing it depending upon what we need to do within each group. And by Friday, we hope that you can install these batch diagnostics here, as well as be able to install and generate and back up the offline diagnostics, because they'll still be generated and assembled online. And all of these diagnostics are contained in program libraries. The only way you can get to them is through update. We talked about some of the PLs for offline diagnostics. We're going to talk next week about some of the system diagnostics and where we can find those. And these diagnostics, the batch diagnostics, were an X200 PL that we started to look at last week. Taking a look at our learning log, we have a second workbook for this week. I'm not going to be using it as heavily as I probably did last week's workbook. Probably just the first chapter. But our basic skills that we want to be working on this week. Tonight, we want to install Dead Start and restart a Cray. Now, actually, we used to do an install, but tonight we are not going to install from scratch. So you can just... Uh, pencil out or whatever the install process we will not be installing this week. A couple of reasons for that uh, that we don't need to go into. We also want to start tonight with using kernel commands, station commands, and interactive station commands. Knowing the different levels of software we're in and where to find these different commands. I've given out all the books that cover all these commands now. Uh, the interactive station commands you be, should be familiar with already because those are basically JCL commands. So those first two things are what we're going to work on tonight, in essence. But at the same time, we'll probably try taking, preparing some jobs that actually install and generate our offline diagnostics just as something to do with the Cray while we're on it, some of the jobs to prepare. But that's more what we're going to talk about tomorrow is the generation of offline diagnostics as well as online diagnostics. How to take these release tapes, load them into the system, and come up with uh, F-dump tapes or onlines that run. And this is a new machine, and XMP, I think it's a two processor. So we'll, we'll see how it works on a different machine taking a standard release tape. It worked on the old machine that we were using last time I run this class. Tomorrow and the next day in lab, we're also going to be dealing with running online diagnostics. And this should be something after last week you should be familiar with. You access the diagnostic, you type in the diagnostic name. However, we're going to look at it from a different viewpoint, and that's a program called Menu. Menu is a Fortran program that writes jobs writes the job and the account and the access and submits them as a batch job. It's an interactive program that submits batch jobs that are diagnostics. The last two things we're going to deal with uh, using the debug utilities. This is the ability to read and write central memory, buffer memory, or local memory. Just like you have MCU basic if you want to write to a specific address, you do a store, an S command. If you want to write to an A register, you do an A1 and the data that you want to put in. If you want to read something, uh, 
We're going to learn how to do those same type of features online and the debugger utilities that let us read memory, write memory, and breakpoint, which we'll probably get into breakpointing too. How many people are familiar with breakpointing? MPS Diagnostic, for example, has a breakpoint feature. You can stop a diagnostic somewhere in the program and examine its registers and see what kind of operands it has, and then start the diagnostic up again. So we'll probably get into breakpointing too. And the last thing here is the Cray Operational Aids and Utilities. This refers to using F-Dump, Extract, and we'll talk about HERG, but I can't find HERG out on the system this time around. So we probably won't actually run any HERG jobs. You don't have enough tape anywhere. Not one that works. We were taking it off the system or something. That was our problem back in the 70s. Yeah. We have X15. No, that's when you're going to shed me some light on it. Well, with X, it's not written for X15, and HERG has a thing in it that says re release level. And the problem is, is that HERG, just like Extract, goes through the system log. And every release has changed the format of the system log. Memory error package formats, the way they're stored in the system log, have changed. So couldn't you just change, alter that part the way it reads the system log? Yeah, but the maintenance of that feature and stuff, the person who wrote HERG is no longer in the diagnostic group, and, you know, it's hard to maintain these things. Extract is maintained pretty well, but HERG is not. It's a new thing. HERG used to be called Breaker and Start, two programs that got put together into one. But if you know Fortran, then you could go into HERG and determine what portion, where he's doing his formatting and rewrite them, but that, that's quite a lot of work in my book. Uh, the diagnostic group should support that. But that's one of the problems with online, is that uh, standards change with each release, specifically Extract and HERG and the way they uh, store data in the system log has changed. And HERG does have a parameter on it that gives you uh, the option of telling you what release level you're running, but I don't think it supports 115 yet. So those are the basic things we want to deal with this week. Last week was the user level, learning to use the products that every user has access to and commonly uses. This week's more in the operator's environment, learning to bring the Cray up and down and dead start parameter files and all this sort of information. Learning how to run diagnostics, the things that are done on the IOP station uniquely. And that's what this week's topics are about. Next week, we're going to deal with the operating system itself and dump analysis. Any questions about uh, the schedule this week, uh, the hours? I'm basically going to leave Thursday night pretty much up in the open. In other words, we've got somebody coming in at 12 to show us the new release and to show us some new things. And I'd like us all to meet here for that. Then when he's done, we'll, we'll decide if anybody wants any specific machine time how we can figure out the next uh, three, four hours that are available. But being that uh, he wants to come in and show us those things, I figure we give him the opportunity. If he's willing to come in at midnight, we'll listen. Not too many analysts do that, huh? No. Well, he's not an analyst, but oh, okay. when he got into it, he didn't know the hours he'd be coming in anyways. <laughs> It's also a test run for him to check his diagnostics, or to check the release. Who is him? Uh, Mick Goyer is the guy's name. He's part of diagnostic testing integration along with Ted Osborne. Deals with uh, DPR database support and stuff like that. Uh, he's under Pat Donlin, if you know the department structure at all. It's changing all the time, so it's hard to keep track. But uh, Mick Goyer is across the street in development and basically is dealing with the DPRs coming in and trying to fix up the release tapes as they go out. The one you take a bad tape that doesn't read to it and stuff like that. So that's the basic schedule. 
If you take a look in your workbook on page one, two, software for CE workbook. Page one, two is a basic list of all the different commands and operations documentation where it's found. For example, starting up the system, how to bring the system up and down. This is in the operator's guide. The kernel and the station commands. The station commands are most obvious because they're the brown pages. If you've got your operator's guide, it's easy to spot because it's got a whole bunch of brown pages. The brown pages are your station commands. Tonight we're going to learn the difference between kernel commands and station commands. We also have dead start parameter files. Every time you bring the system up and down, specifically when you use the start command, start space coast space restart, something like that. That uses a text file, something that's written with Teddy, just a standard ASCII text file, to tell startup how to go through this startup procedure. Do we want a dead start? In other words, start all our jobs from zero. Do we want to restart? In other words, start all the jobs over. Uh, warm start, do we want to pick up the jobs from where they left off? Uh, install, install is what you hope you don't do too often. That basically deletes everything that's on the disk drives and writes a new data set catalog. Various other options in Dead Start parameter files that uh, we'll be talking about. Those are all in your operational procedures, the SM43. The editor that maintains these Dead Start parameter files is described in the operator's guide. This is an editor very much like Teddy, except it's only got seven commands to it. It's a lot easier to use. But it's very, very similar to Teddy. We're going to be using that tonight. So that's in the operator's guide. The IOP debugger. You don't have this book yet, the iOS internals. You'll be getting that next week. But I'll show you how to use the IOP debugger and how to read and write memory, buffer memory, local memory, operand registers, find out what's in them. The COST debugger you do have, though, in your SM43. And we're going to be using that a little bit more extensively. The COST debugger allows you to read memory, write memory, breakpoint a job, stop it at a specific address, that sort of thing. System dumping is also covered in the SM43. There are two ways of dumping the system. One is a program called SysDump, which is the normal way of dumping the system. The advantage of SysDump is that it keeps a permanent data set that you could do formatted dumps of over and over again. It keeps, keeps a permanent data set that's a record of that dump. Whereas there is another method of dumping, and that is file two on tape. And this is called dollar dump, dollar sign dump. And this is a very, very raw form of dump that just goes to the Gould printer. The paper is the only form of dump you have. Is that what is called a raw dump? A raw or dump? A raw dump something else. Yeah, there are different methods of using the word raw dump. Uh, the other method of raw dump is with F dump. F-dump has the ability of keeping symbol tables when you generate your operating system and formatting all your tables out with the name of the table and breaking the fields apart. We call that a formatted dump. And oftentimes they'll also refer a raw dump as just straight memory using F-dump, where you're just looking at addresses 0 to 15,000, whereas with the formatted dump, it would just dump the tables, the name of the table, and what's in it and stuff. I'll pass around an example of these different types of dumps by the end of the week. But there are two methods of dumping the system. One is sysdump and the other is dollar dump. Both of those are talked about. And sysdump specifically is in the operator's guide as well as some internal stuff. And you probably really don't need to worry about the internals. That describes the programs and what they do. If you get into coast generation, that's in your SM43. We're not going to discuss that. Uh, Chippewa Falls does generate their own coasts. 
the, the customer engineers have canned jobs that they go in and follow procedure where they edit the job name and, and various things that are changed within the job, and then they submit them. We're not going to get into generating the operating system this week. Install processes are found in the release letters that come with the release tape that you've got. So generally the install process, you refer to the specific ta tape and the specific letter that goes with that tape. These iOS diagnostics, system diagnostics I was talking about, are described in the iOS internals manual. And again, I'll be handing that out next week. Lastly, we have the coast stations diagnostics. And those are talked about in some of these release letters that we have here. So I passed out to you the operational procedures guide simply for the coast debugger facilities and dead start parameter files. That's why you've got the SM43 just to reference those. The operator's guide is what I hope you're going to be using tonight. Learning to use the operator's guide. There's a lot of information in the operator's guide and that's going to be your your tool on the IOP station and what commands you have available. Uh, tomorrow or Wednesday, we're going to talk about the operational aids. That book basically describes things like the F-dump and extract. There's quite a few things in the operational aids you do not need to know about, such as job class definitions or accounting structures set up, uh, the things that the analyst needs to use. But we're going to be using a couple of pages out of there so you get the whole book anyways. And we'll also be talking about iOS later. I've handed out also this Diagnostic Programmer's Procedures and Guidelines. It basically describes if you're going to be doing any development of diagnostics, the format that they'd like you to stick to. One of the reasons or advantages is because they now have a ready reference manual. This isn't the one, but they're blue. But they have ready reference manuals describing the internals of each diagnostic. And that's all automated. And in order for that automation to work, you have to write your uh, comments and stuff in a specific process. They have to be in certain areas. So that blue book describes uh, the guidelines and how you want to write your diagnostics. It even gets into some of the development process and planning what you're going to do with your diagnostics, the development process, and standards like that. Uh, it gets into some of the 2.0, this is a 2.0 release book, and it gets into some of the new stuff, the diagnostic information block and the diagnostic information packet that are part of the M2 monitor. And uh, the second part of this book gets into the diagnostic problem report process and the uh, standardization of your identifiers and updates. When you make a change using update into a diagnostic, they want you to use an identifier that is the DPR number so that they can connect these things a little bit better and trace them down. And it talks about that in there too. I'm not specifically giving any reading or any assignments in this book, I'm just passing it out. You might also put in that blue book though the release letters. We're going to be using these release letters this week. You have three release letters. The first one describes the 983 XMP release. And this is basically the offlines for an XMP. That's your first letter. Uh, dated September 15th. The second letter you have in there is for the XMP 983 online release. So the first one's the offlines for an XMP, the second one is the onlines. And the third letter is the preliminary 2.0 release letter. Once in a while or a couple months back it wasn't preliminary, it was official, but then they uh, postponed a few things and the date is March 19th. But the process of installing the 2.0 release is still going to be the same. The only changes are in like the monitor and the actual code that's in the monitor. That's what they're debating about or working on now. So 
We have three release letters covering three different releases. One is the offline XMPs, one is the online, those are both 983 release. And the third one is the 2.0 release that's coming out. Coming out. We're going to see some of the 2.0 release on Thursday night, Friday morning. Those are the basic books that have been passed out. And we're going to be poking into some of these areas. Are there any questions on the books that you have? The one that has the most update changes is the operational procedures because for each release, the whole release process or the install process changes. So your whole first section of that book gets replaced with every release. The coast debugger and dead start parameter files haven't really changed that much. It's just the install and generation.